Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. so um, إن شاء الله تعالى this is in place we we usually do فتح الباري uh, an إعلام السنة the study of صحيح البخاري on Tuesdays tonight إن شاء الله تعالى we're going to take a, a different direction and uh, this is going to be, at least for me, this was an interesting preparation experience. So hopefully you guys will find it beneficial. We're going to focus on the virtues of Ramadan from a hadith. Now, as you guys know, as Ramadan starts to come around, you start getting all these uh, emails, Facebook posts, like if you don't share this uh, post with 10 people, your Ramadan is not accepted. Or, you know, uh, the, the, um, you know, the gates of hellfire are closed, or, or the gates of paradise are only open for the people who share this post. Or, you know, if you do this, then you get a million hasanat. If you do this, then you get the reward of a million Ramadans. You get a lot of strange messages being passed around at this time of the year. And uh, strange ahadith, and, or, or ahadith, right? So this is going to be, inshallah ta'ala, something where we'll go through sahih and weak and fabricated ahadith about the virtues of Ramadan. Now, I'm not going to make a hadith up. If I say a hadith, that means it falls into one of those three categories. It's been fabricated and it's widespread. Okay, so just because you didn't hear the fabricated hadith doesn't mean that someone did not fabricate it. All right, uh, just a general introduction to this concept though. When you study fada'il, particularly the topic of fada'il, or, or the topic of, uh, of things that are uh, blessed and virtuous uh, through hadith, um, there's, there, there are a few rulings. Number one, is it permissible to use weak ahadith when describing the virtues of an action? Is it permissible to use weak ahadith? Alright, you guys are going to have to participate. What do you guys think? Is it permissible? So for example, if there's a weak hadith about the virtue of hajj, is it permissible to use it? It depends. It depends. As long as, there are two conditions. Number one, it's not extremely weak. So it's not fabricated. It doesn't fall into the category of maldur or munkar. Something that is baseless or fabricated. Or la'if jiddan, extremely weak. So that's number one. That it's a slightly weak hadith. And slightly weak would mean that there's a missing chain, but the narrators are still trustworthy. Other than that, maybe that one chain. Um, you know, that, that there's, there's a slight weakness to it, and even if there is not such a small weakness to it, it's just still not an extremely weak hadith. That's number one. So the sanad of it, the chain of it, is not extremely weak. Number two, in regards to the meaning of the hadith, it's important that the hadith does not establish any new action. So for example, if there is a hadith that is weak about the virtue of performing hajj, it's still permissible to use as long as you say it's a weak hadith. So you'll find in the books of Tuski, the books of spirituality, they'll do that about Hajj, about Ramadan, about anything. But if there's a hadith that says, for example, if you do Hajj in this year, then it's, it's, it has such and such virtue, then you can't use it because it establishes or it acts as a basis for a new addition, an innovation in the religion. Okay, so I'm not knocking on the entire concept of using weak ahadith for the purpose of fala'il. And inshallah ta'ala I'll mention when a hadith is weak and when a hadith is fabricated. Um, and the way that this is going to work is that I'm going to say a hadith and I'm going to ask you guys. So this is how you're going to participate inshallah. And you're not going to just, you know, shake your heads. Try to actively participate. I'm going to say a hadith and you're going to tell me as an audience whether you think it's weak or strong. Okay? Alright, you guys ready? So we're going to start off with the names in which the Prophet ﷺ referred to Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. Some of these ahadith will sound familiar to you, some of them may not. There are ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he calls Ramadan, Ramadan. There are ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he calls Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. And there are ahadith where the Prophet ﷺ calls Ramadan, the month of something else. Alright, so we're going to start off with those categories. Number one, first you tell me if this hadith is authentic, weak, or fabricated in your mind. لا تقول جاء رمضان فإن رمضان اسم من أسماء الله ولكن قولوا جاء شهر رمضان. That the Prophet ﷺ said, do not say Ramadan has come, for verily Ramadan is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead say, the month of Ramadan has come. Da'if. Or Sahih? Da'if. 
Okay, so this is a weak hadith. It's actually an extremely weak hadith. Uh, it's narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad. It is spread quite frequently actually. Um, to say that you can't say Ramadan without saying the month of Ramadan. Alright? Now, this is disproved by the fact that not only the Sanad is weak, not only the chain is weak, but that the Prophet ﷺ at times referred to Ramadan as simply Ramadan. Alright? Now, there are plenty, plenty of ahadith where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, is supposed to have said, O oh people, the month of Ramadan has come upon you, and then it's like three paragraphs about the month of Ramadan. Almost all of those ahadith are fabricated. Okay, so you see these long ahadith that are circulated around, that the Prophet ﷺ stood up and said, Oh people, the month of Ramadan is here. And it just goes through basically everything you've ever heard about Ramadan. Those are pieced together, fabricated narrations. Alright? There is a very long narration that's narrated by Ibn Khuzayma, Al-Imam Ibn Khuzayma rahimahullah ta'ala. And he titled it, he says, In Sah al-Hadith, if the hadith is authentic. Meaning he himself wasn't sure when he narrated the hadith. And it's a long hadith about the month of Ramadan. And a lot of the uh, weak virtues that we take from the month of Ramadan are taken from that particular long narration that the author of the book himself was unsure of. Okay? Now, what, what are some hadith that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about uh, Ramadan? I'll give you a hadith and you guys tell me if you think it's authentic or not. Abu Hurairah says that the Prophet ﷺ said, there has come to you Ramadan, a blessed month, which Allah Almighty has enjoined upon you to fast. In it, the gates of heavens are opened, and the gates of hellfire are closed, and every devil is chained up. In it, Allah has a night which is better than a thousand months. Whoever is deprived of its goodness is indeed deprived. What do you guys think? Authentic or Sahih? Okay. The hadith in the Arabic language from Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet ﷺ says, أَتَاكُمْ رَمَضَانُ شَهْرٌ مُبَارَكٌ That Ramadan has come to you, a blessed month, شَهْرٌ مُبَارَكٌ فَرَّضَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this obligatory upon you, صِيَامَهُ تُفْتَحُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ وَتُغْلَقُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ الْجَحِيمِ وَتُغَلُّ عَلَيْكُمْ فِيهِ مَرَدَةُ الشَّيَاطِينِ So the, the hadith says, Ramadan has come upon you, a blessed month. So from it we take the first ruling in Islam, is it permissible to say Ramadan Mubarak? Yes, because the Prophet ﷺ called it a blessed month. So this is where the scholars say you can say Ramadan Mubarak, because the Prophet ﷺ called it a blessed month in this hadith. Which Allah has enjoined upon you to fast, so it's made mandatory upon you. In it the gates of heaven are opened, and the gates of hellfire are closed, and every devil is chained up. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, In it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, Laylatun khayrun min alfi shahrin, A night that is better than a thousand months. Man hurrima khayraha faqad hurim. Whoever has been deprived of its blessings has indeed been deprived. Alright? So this is a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentions Ramadan again, without saying the month of Ramadan, and he mentioned some common things that we've heard about uh, the month of Ramadan. Now let's continue on this concept. The Prophet ﷺ said that in Ramadan the gates of heaven are open, the gates of hellfire are closed, and the shayateen are put up. Rasulullah ﷺ said in another hadith, which is authentic, he says, إِذَا جَاءَ رَمَضَانَ فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ وَصُفِّدَتِ الشَّيَاطِينَ the Prophet ﷺ says, when Ramadan comes, the gates of paradise are opened, the gates of the fire are locked, and the shayateen are locked up. Now I'm going to give you guys another narration. These are common narrations. Listen to this hadith, and you tell me if you think it is weak or authentic. Rasulullah ﷺ says, إِذَا دَخَلَ رَمَضَانُ فُتِّحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ جَهَنَّمِ وَسُلْسِلَةِ الشَّيَاطِينَ When Ramadan begins, the gates of mercy are opened, the gates of the fire are closed, and the devils are chained up. What do you guys think? What's the wording that's different here? Futihat abwabur rahma. The gates of mercy have been opened. Have you guys ever heard that one before? Okay. No, you haven't, but it is an authentic hadith. And there's a great blessing in it. This hadith is narrated in Sunan al-Nasa'i from Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. 
Why is the Prophet ﷺ here saying Abwab ur Rahmah? So this is the first lesson we're gonna stop at tonight, inshallah ta'ala. Why the gates of mercy as opposed to the gates of paradise? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at times calls Jannah his mercy. Alright? So the word Rahmah in hadith literature and even in the Quran, the word mercy can sometimes actually mean Jannah. It can sometimes actually mean paradise because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only enters people into paradise by what? His mercy, His Rahmah. Okay? So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمَّنْ هُوَ قَانِتٌ أَنَاءَ اللَّيْلِ سَاجِدًا أَوْ قَائِمًا يَحْذَرُ الْآخِرَ وَيَرْجُ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّهِ That isn't he who stands up or who spends the entire night in prayer, standing, sitting in prostration. In some way, he's, he's up worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَحْذَرُ الْآخِرَ وَيَرْجُ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّهِ and he fears the hereafter, and he desires the mercy of his Lord. Here, يَحْذُرُ الْآخِرَةِ الْآخِرَةِ here means, the hereafter here means hellfire. وَيَرْجُ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّي And he wants the mercy of his Lord. The rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here means his Jannah. So the Prophet ﷺ refers to al-Jannah in, in one of the hadith here about Ramadan as the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the same thing. Also notice in these ahadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentions maradatu shayateen, the big devils being chained up. Okay, there's a misconception that when Ramadan comes, all the shayateen are gone. Actually, I remember I was doing a fundraiser a few years ago, and, and I said, uh, you know, everyone say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, and someone was like, we don't have to say that in Ramadan, right? <laughs> there are no shayateen, we don't have to seek refuge in Allah from the devils, they're not here anymore, okay? But what the Prophet ﷺ is telling us when you add the narrations of Ramadan, are that the big shayateen are chained up. And so when the big shayateen are chained up, the effect of the devils on the people is less. So they're still around, the little ones are still around, all right? And you're still going to you know, have the probability to commit sin due to your own corruption, and due to the influence of those little shayateen, but the big devils are chained up. All right, paradise is open, the doors of paradise are opened, the doors of hellfire are locked shut. And the major devils are chained away. Now, I'll give you some other hadith, I'm not saying they're authentic yet, where the Prophet ﷺ calls Ramadan by different names. Uh, this hadith is from Abu Bakr that the Prophet ﷺ says, Shahrani la yanqusani. Shahra Eidin Ramadanu wa Dhul Hijjah that, the t that there are two months that do not decrease in their blessings. Meaning there are two months that are just always giving off their blessings. And he says the two months of Eid. The two months of Eid. Ramadan and what's the other month of Eid? Dhul Hijjah. Is this hadith authentic or not? What do you guys think? Sahih or Da'if? To make this interesting you guys have to actually answer. It's okay. Brothers, your voice is not awrah, nor is your sister. Is, is it sahih or daif? Okay, this hadith is authentic. It's a sahih hadith from Al-Bukhari. That the Prophet ﷺ called Ramadan the month of Eid. Okay? Yeah. I'm getting to that, alright? <laughs> Isn't Eid after Ramadan? So why would the Prophet ﷺ call Shahr Ramadan the month of Eid? We understand Dhul Hijjah because Dhul Hijjah is a month that actually has Eid in it. Okay, Ibn Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala, he comments on this hadith and he says, because the true celebration in Ramadan starts with the beginning of it. Meaning if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed you to die and Ramadan has already started, you've already gotten the reward of someone who's already celebrated Eid. So the Prophet called the month of Ramadan the month of Eid as well. Even though Eid comes with the next month, with Shawwal, the Prophet ﷺ called it the month, a month of celebration. He included it as a month of celebration. Another hadith I'll give you guys. Abu Hurairah says that I heard the Messenger of Allah ﷺ say, the month of patience and three days of each month is fasting for an entire lifetime. The month of patience. Shahru sabri wa thalathatu ayyamin min kulli shahrin sawmu dahr. What do you guys think? Authentic or weak? Sahih or da'if? All the sisters are just like, we're not getting involved. The Sahih or Daif? It is an authentic hadith. 
The Prophet ﷺ referred to Ramadan as a month of patience. This hadith is narrated in Sunan al-Nasa'i. Rasulullah ﷺ said, the month of patience. Shahrul sabri Alright? It's a month that requires a great level of patience from us. Alright? And in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ says, that half of, half of entering Jannah is patience. Okay? He also said, وَالصَّبْرُ الْضِيَاءَ Alright, patience is a victory. Prophet ﷺ referred to patience in many different ways, right? Patience is something that's very praiseworthy. Now, the fiqh connotation of this, what we take from this hadith, when the Prophet ﷺ says, the month of patience and three days every month. What three days is he referring to? The 13th, 14th, and 15th of every Islamic month, every Hijri month, Ayyam al Bil, the white days. Why are they the white days? Not because there's a preference to white over black, because the, the moon is fuller at those times. Alright? So the Prophet ﷺ taught us to fast those three days of the month. And he said, if you fast Ramadan and you, make, and, and, you make, and you keep up the habit of fasting those three days, then it's as if you fasted your entire lifetime. Why? Because Allah multiplies each good deed by at least 10. So if you're fasting three days a month, it's as if you're fasting the entire month. It's as if you're fasting 30 days at least. So it's as if you're fasting the month. So it's like the Prophet said, it's, you would die and you'd meet Allah as if you fasted your entire life. Can you imagine if you met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's as if you fasted your entire life? SubhanAllah, how amazing is that, right? Now the usage of calling Ramadan, Shahru Sabr. The month of patience is also done in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَةِ Alright? Seek help in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or seek closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through patience and prayer. And most of the Mufassireen, they say that as-sabri here, actually with patience in this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah refers to fasting. Okay? So Allah calls fasting patience and the Prophet ﷺ calls the month of Ramadan Patience. All right. Now let's go through some of the uh, the common hadith about the virtue of the month. All right. Uh, the first hadith: Man sama Ramadan and iman and wahti saban ghufira lahu ma taqaddam min dhambihi. Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan out of sincere faith and seeking Allah's reward, it's as if he's fasted. Or, I'm sorry. He would be forgiven for all of his past sins. What do you guys think? Sahih, right? Yeah, you're not that bad. We say that one every year, right? All right, then what about this hadith then? Um, من قام رمضان Whoever stands up in Ramadan, meaning what? Praise the night prayers in Ramadan. إِمَانًا وَحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ He'll be forgiven for all of his previous sins. صحيح or ضعيف? That one's authentic as well. Okay, what about this one? من قام ليلة القدر إِمَانًا وَحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ Whoever stands up just the night of Layl and reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he will be forgiven for all of his previous sins. Can someone take care of the kids back there by the way, inshallah? If someone can, can do that. Is that authentic or weak? That one's strong as well. So these are three ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu that one word changes in each one, but they all guarantee the same reward. Alright? If you stand up in sincere faith and prayer every night in Ramadan, then you will be forgiven for everything that you've done before. If you just catch Laylatul Qadr, you'll be forgiven for everything that you've done before. If you fast the month of Ramadan properly, then you'll be forgiven for everything that's been, that, that's been done before. The beauty of this hadith, the beauty of these three ahadith together, all right, that each one basically provides a chance for the other one. All right, meaning what? Let's say you didn't catch Laylatul Qadr for some reason. All right, but you fasted properly throughout the month, then you'll get that reward. Let's say that you prayed Qiyamul Layl regularly throughout the month of Ramadan, and Qiyamul Layl is Taraweeh. You prayed Taraweeh prayer regularly throughout the month, but you didn't do anything extra on Laylatul Qadr, meaning you just prayed Taraweeh every night in Ramadan. If you did it properly, all of your previous sins are forgiven. All right, and let's say that your fasting was deficient. And you missed a lot of nights of Taraweeh, you missed a lot of nights of Qiyamul Layl. But you were fortunate enough to catch Laylatul Qadr. You're forgiven for everything you've done before. You see the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ? Essentially the Prophet ﷺ is telling you, in this month you've got, you've got numerous opportunities 
to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be forgiven for your past sins. Right? So basically seek to do all three of them. And inshallah ta'ala, if one failed you, you'll get the other two. And if two failed you, you'll at least get one of them. Right? So this is what the Prophet ﷺ mentions about the virtue of the month. Now, does the Ramadan serve as an expiation for um, major sins as well? Does Ramadan count as an expiation for major sins as well, or just the minor sins? Okay. So here's a hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says that the five daily prayers between one another from salah to salah is a uh, kafara, is an, is an expiation for, for that which is between them. Jum'ah to Jum'ah, Friday prayer to Friday prayer, is an expiation between the two. And the Prophet ﷺ says, from Ramadan to Ramadan, مُكَفِّرَاتٌ مَا بَيْنَهُنَّ إِذَا اجْتَنَبَ الْكَبَائِرِ So the Prophet ﷺ said that these three things serve as expiations between the two of them, so long as a person avoided the major sins, authentic or weak. Hadith is in Sahih Muslim, it's an authentic hadith. Alright? So Ramadan is basically like your it's basically like your yearly salah in that sense. So the Prophet is saying you have the five daily prayers that eliminate everything between them. Alright, the minor sins. And you have um, you know Jum'ah to Jum'ah, Friday prayer to Friday prayer, which eliminates the minor sins between them. And then you have annually Ramadan to Ramadan, which eliminates everything between them. All right. Now the Prophet ﷺ says, so long as you avoid al-kaba'ir, you avoid the major sins. Now, what are the things that forgive major sins? Right, becoming Muslim, Hajj, and one more, Hijrah. All right. The three actions. I'm not. I'm not talking about repentance now. But there are three actions that the Prophet ﷺ said do away with major sins. He said. Entrance into Islam. Okay, this is a hadith of Amr ibn As anhu. When he became Muslim, there are three things that do away with everything before them. Entering into Islam, doing Hajj, or doing Hijrah, or, or migrating for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright? Now here's the thing. Let's say that you don't have the opportunity to do those three things. Like, should I go commit kufr and then become Muslim again so I can get that one? It seems pretty easy. Just come back and take shahada the next day. It doesn't work that way. You might die in between them, right? But the Prophet ﷺ also teaches us that sincere repentance can do away with anything. So a tawbah and nasuha, the sincere repentance that you might experience in Ramadan, all right, could do away with everything. And Ramadan sets the stage. This is the beautiful thing. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he commented on this hadith. He said, even if Ramadan in and of itself, listen to this beautiful reasoning. He said, even if Ramadan in and of itself is not like Hajj, where the performance of it does away with your previous major sins. He said, there is no time of the year that you're going to be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than Ramadan. And there is no time that you're more likely to really sincerely repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than when you're closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ramadan. Right? The closeness we experience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ramadan is unlike the closeness we experience throughout the year. So that's, the, that's your greatest opportunity to just shed a tear. You know, while you're standing up looking for Laylatul Qadr, you shed a tear and you, and, and you really make istighfar, even if you committed adultery, even if you committed a major sin in the past, it would do away with it insha'Allah ta'ala. Alright? So the performance of Ramadan in and of itself does not do that. It serves in, you know, it serves in that capacity. Um, but what Ramadan gives you spiritually, makes it likely for you insha'Allah ta'ala to experience that sincere repentance which can do away with your major sins. Alright, I'll give you guys another hadith. Um, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said to the companions, which of you remembers what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about fitna? What he said about tests and trials? Hudayfa radiallahu anhu said, I do. Hudayfa said, a, a, a person's fitwa, a per, not fitwa, that's not a word, I don't think it's a word. A person's fitna is in their family, their wealth, their children, and their neighbors. Meaning you'll be tested for good or bad through family here, al-ahl means your spouse. Alright, your spouse, your wealth, your children, or your neighbors. So good or bad in any of those four categories will be a test for you, right? And he says, it is atoned for by salah, fasting, charity, and commanding good and forbidding evil. Is this an authentic hadith or a weak hadith? What do you guys think? It's a sahih hadith. You guys need to answer to make this interesting. We got a lot of hadith to cover.
All right, it's an authentic hadith. It's in Al Bukhari. Fitna to Rajuri. Fi ahlihi wa malihi wa waladihi wa jarihi. You kafiru has salata was salata was salmu was sadaka. Wal amru bil ma'roof wa nahyu anil munkar. The Prophet said that, uh, that a person is tested with those four things. And what does away with those tests is prayer, fasting, charity, enjoining good, and forbidding evil. So fasting comes in the same category as prayer and charity, which is why I'm mentioning it to you here. All right, another hadith. Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, the Prophet says, this is from Umar radiallahu anhu, the Prophet said, the month of Ramadan is suspended between the heavens and the earth and is not raised up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until a person pays zakat al-fitr. Sahih or life? It's life. It's a weak hadith. So this is one of those commonly spread weak narrations. All right, and I'm not saying you don't have to pay zakat al-fitr. Zakat al-fitr is wajib. It's mandatory for the person that can pay it. But this is a commonly quoted hadith. Um, and it's actually an extremely weak hadith. That basically your Ramadan is not going to count. It's suspended until you pay your zakat al-fitr. All right, another hadith. Uh, this hadith from Anas that the Prophet ﷺ says, when it's the first night of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at His creation. And when Allah looks at His slave, never will He punish him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees a million people from the fire every night in Ramadan. Sahih or life? This is maldur, it's a fabricated hadith. So this is a Facebook hadith, all right? Um, all right, another hadith. Uh, Ibn Abbas says that the Prophet Sallallahu said, the first part of the month of Ramadan is its mercy, in the middle part of it is its forgiveness, and in the end of it is freedom from the fire. Sahih or Dhaif? Munkar, fabricated. Don't get mad at me, guys. Uh, look, last year I said this in a khutbah, not in a khutbah, I said this in a lecture. I said that the, the narration about the first 10 days being mercy, the second 10 days being forgiveness, the third 10 days being protection from the fire, when I said it's actually a bit completely baseless narration, right? Some guy came up to me afterwards, he says, it is sahih. And I was like, well, what's the proof of it? He says, it is sahih. And I was like, that doesn't make it authentic. You can't just say, it is sahih. Because we've been hearing it for the last, you know, our whole life, all right? It doesn't count, okay? And in fact, the hadith contradicts other hadith, okay? Um, so it contradicts the other hadith because basically then you'll, you'll just kind of, you know, what if you die in, in, in the middle of 10 days of Ramadan? Does that mean you're not going to be freed from hellfire? Okay, like it's like just wait for the last 10, right? So it almost, it almost uh, serves that lazy behavior of waiting for the last 10 nights of Ramadan to do anything, all right? All right, I'll give you guys another hadith. Abu Huraira narrates that the Prophet ﷺ says, when the first night of Ramadan comes, the shaytans and the, mis the, the shayateen, the devils and the mischievous jinns are chained up and the gates of the fire are closed, and none of its gates are opened. The gates of paradise are opened, and none of its gates are closed. And a caller cries out, Ya baghi al-khayri aqbil, wa ya baghi al-sharri aqsir, O seeker of good, proceed, and O seeker of evil, stop, be stopped in your tracks. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has necks that He frees from the fire every single night. Sahih or Dhaif? Is it authentic or weak? This is an authentic hadith. Uh, it's in Ibn Majah and it's an authentic hadith. It's a beautiful hadith. hadith. Uh, again, the Prophet ﷺ is saying that every single gate of paradise is opened in Ramadan. Now, the Prophet ﷺ said there are different gates of paradise, right? Okay, they're not all the gates of fasting. But every single gate of paradise is open. Why? Because Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he comments on that and he says, a person will excel in every good deed in Ramadan. So even if you're going to get into Jannah through the, the door of the gate of prayer, or the gate of charity, or whatever gate it may be, it's going to only be multiplied in Ramadan. We see it in the behavior of the Prophet Wasallam, right? He prayed more in Ramadan, he read more Quran in Ramadan, he gave more charity in Ramadan, and we're all more likely to do the same. So all of the gates of paradise are opened. And all of the gates of hellfire are shut. Why? Because Ramadan, if a person fasts properly, Allah shuts the gate basically of every sin. You know? So you're not going to commit a sin of zina if you're paying attention, right? Adultery. With your hands or with your eyes, you're going to keep yourself pure from adultery. You're not going to backbite. You're not going to gossip. You're not going to fight with people or quarrel with people. You're just going to say, Inni sa'im, I'm fasting when people try to quarrel with you. Okay? 
you're not going to eat haram because you're not eating anyway. All right. The point is, is that Allah shuts the gates or the things that lead to hellfire in Ramadan. Right? And subhanAllah, and even though, you know, there is a level of hypocrisy sometimes where it's like when a person says, well, I'm not going to listen to this because it's Ramadan right now. Alright? That's, that's problematic. And, and you know, it's funny because I remember one person was arguing with me like, this is halal. Alright? There's nothing wrong with it. Shaykh so and so said it. But in Ramadan, he says, I don't listen to it. I said, well, if it's halal, how come you don't listen to it in Ramadan? Alright? So you know it's wrong, but it's like, in Ramadan, I'm not going to watch these things. In Ramadan, I'm not going to listen to these things. In Ramadan, I'm not going to do this. In Ramadan, I'm not going to talk like this. That's supposed to be a lifelong commitment, right? But, on the other hand, Allah really shuts the gates for these things. Like you don't even, subhanAllah, you find yourself more easily cutting off from these things in Ramadan, right? And hopefully they become lifelong commitments, inshaAllah ta'ala. So all of the gates of paradise are opened in Ramadan. Not a single one is left closed. All of the gates of hellfire are closed in Ramadan. Not a single one is left open. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it called out, Ya baghi al khayri aqbil. If you're seeking good, come forth. This is the time to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرْ أَخْسِرْ And if you were really falling back before Ramadan, stop in your tracks. Allah is telling you, stop right now and start turning around. Start changing your life at this point and turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the beautiful part of this hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees people from hellfire every single night. Okay? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says, "Wallahi utaqa min al-nari, wa dalika fi kulli layla." Allah frees people from hellfire every night, and that is every night of Ramadan. What that means is your freedom from hellfire might come on a random day in Ramadan. All right, meaning you just fasted good that you you did what you had to do that day. You know what? You prayed your five prayers on time. You might might have even caught some of them in jama'a in congregation. You prayed tarawih, you focused, you were into it, you didn't get into any fights that day, you had a moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe you were reading Qur'an that day and you, you came across a story or you were listening to a lecture and you felt close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that day. That's the, that was your night. That was the night that Allah freed you from hellfire. Right? It can be any night. It could be the first night of Ramadan. We ask Allah that it's the first night of Ramadan. Everyone say Ameen, it's okay. That's Sahih, you can say Ameen after a dua. Right? So, you know, you want it to be the first night, right? So you pursue this every single night that Allah is going to free me from hellfire tonight, that I'm going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that I will be amongst those who are freed tonight. I'm not going to wait uh, for another night. Now, another hadith that I'm going to share now, we move on with the virtues of Ramadan. Abu Sa'id narrates that the Prophet ﷺ says that whoever fasts one day seeking Allah's pleasure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will distance his face away from the hellfire for a journey, a distance that covers a journey of 70 years. Okay. Alright? So I'm going to say it in Arabic. مَنْ صَامَ يَوْمًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بَعَدَ اللَّهُ وَجْهَهُ عَنِ النَّارِ سَبْعِينَ خَرِيفًا This is an authentic hadith or a weak hadith? <laughs> this is an authentic hadith. It's a beautiful hadith. It's in Al-Bukhari. That for every day that you fast, seeking Allah's pleasure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes your face from the hellfire, a distance of a journey of 70 years. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that he puts ditches between you, 70 ditches between you and hellfire. The distance between the two edges of each one of those ditches is the distance between the heavens and the earth. So if you fasted every single day of Ramadan, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else, how many years have been placed between you and Allah subhanahu between you and the hellfire? How much has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distanced you from the hellfire? In another hadith, uh, Uthman ibn Abil As, he says that the Prophet ﷺ says, As salmu Junnatun min nar Fasting is a shield from hellfire. Is it authentic or is it weak? This hadith is Sahih as well. That fasting is like a shield from the hellfire. SubhanAllah, isn't that beautiful? Like so. Just to recap, Allah frees people from hellfire. And when Allah frees you from hellfire, that's it, right? Like when Allah makes you one of the utaqa, we ask Allah to make us amongst them, those who are freed, it means Allah has freed you from hellfire. All right? And if you do it every single day, you seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're fasting properly, 70 years between you and hellfire, or 70 ditches between you and hellfire. All right? And then Rasulullah says, fasting is your shield from hellfire. It's like a protection from the hellfire uh, for you. 
Now what about Jannah? What about Paradise? Sahil radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, there is a gate in Paradise called Ar-Rayyan. And those who observe fasting will enter through it on the Day of Judgment. And none except them will enter through it. It will be called out, Aina Sa'imun. Where are those who used to fast? They will get up, and none except them will enter through it. And after they enter into that gate, that gate will be closed, and no one else will enter through it. Sahih or Da'if? Sahih. Alright? So there is a particular gate in Jannah called Ar Rayyan. Now, the scholars, they, they debated about this. They said, is this someone who fasts extra on top of Ramadan? Because everyone, ha you know, if you're going to be a Muslim, you have to fast Ramadan. So is this someone who excels in fasting? And subhanAllah, you know, Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah had a beautiful explanation for the hadith. He said that it can be both. He said, either a person does his Ramadan right, so the quality of his fard fasting, the quality of his obligatory fasting, was so great that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, uh, deems you amongst those who fast, right? Because not everyone is truly fasting in the month of Ramadan. Spiritually, they're not fasting. So Allah dubs you that way because you're doing Ramadan properly or you're a person who loves to fast. So when Ramadan is over, you still observe three days of the month, you still observe Mondays and Thursdays, you still observe, you know, Ashura and Arafah and things of that sort. But the point is here, there's a gate in Jannah for people uh, that fast and it's only for the people that fast and those that will enter Jannah through it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Alright, another hadith from Anas that the Prophet says, if the servants of Allah knew how great Ramadan was, then they would wish that Ramadan lasted all year. Indeed, paradise is decorated for Ramadan from the start of the year until the next year. Sahih or Da'if? This is a weak hadith. This is a Facebook hadith. Alright, actually it's a fabricated one. Alright, this is one of those hadith that spread around. However, an authentic narration in its place. Um, the Prophet says, يُزَيِّنُ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةَ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ فِي رَمَضَانِ Allah beautifies Jannah every day in Ramadan. Like Allah increases its beauty every single day in Ramadan. فَيَقُولُ Allah says to it, تَزَيَّنِي Beautify yourself. Keep getting better. SubhanAllah, Jannah, every Ramadan, Jannah gets better. Every day of Ramadan. تَزَيَّنِي يُوشِكُ عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ أَنْ يُلْقُوا عَنْهُمُ الْمَأُونَةَ وَالْأَذَى وَيَصِيرُوا إِلَيْكَ In one narration, وَيَدْخُلُونَكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as He decorates Jannah every single day in Ramadan, beautify yourself. For soon my anticipating righteous servants, those righteous servants that are anticipating me, they just can't wait to meet me, they can't wait to enter into my mercy, Soon they will come forth and they will shed all of their hardships and they will shed all of their anxiety and they will enter into you. They would reach their destination and enter into you. So this is an authentic hadith. All right. So every day your house in Ramadan, your house in paradise is getting better. Paradise as a, as a whole is getting more beautiful every single day in Ramadan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Jannah to get prettier for you. SubhanAllah, that's every day in Ramadan. Alright, what about on the Day of Judgment? Abu Hurairah says that the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah has said, every good deed of the son of Adam is for him except for fasting. as fasting is for me, and I reward accordingly. bihi, And I shall reward the fasting person accordingly. Verily, the smell of the mouth of the fasting person is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the smell of musk. Sahih or daif? This is a famous authentic hadith in Al-Bukhari. And it's a beautiful hadith. Now obviously why? Because fasting in Ramadan requires a certain level of sincerity from you. Why? Because all of the other deeds have some sort of a public component to them. But your fasting is purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because if you really, really wanted to sneak, sneak off and break your fast, you could. But you maintain it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, fasting is for me. وَأَنَا أَجْزِي بِهِ This is what I want to talk about in the hadith. I reward accordingly. Now doesn't Allah reward all good deeds? Who else is going to reward you on the Day of Judgment? So what does it mean when Allah says, I will reward you accordingly on the Day of Judgment? Like this is mine, I will record it, award. I will reward it accordingly. What does that mean? According to intentions. According to intentions. What else? What do you guys think? There's no specified reward. It's no specified reward. What else? 
The angels don't write, they write down your fasting. Inshallah. Alright, so the, it's really in the second one. Sufyan ibn Uyayna rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not quantified the reward for fasting a day in Ramadan. Meaning all of these ahadith that are mentioning, you know, the rewards of fasting a day of Ramadan, like Allah has not said that this is what you get for fasting a day of Ramadan and that's it. Allah has left it open. Why? Because on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the basis of your sincerity, will reward it and multiply it as much as He wants. And Sufyan ibn Uyayna rahimahullah ta'ala, he comments as well, and this is very beautiful. He says that, you know, on the day of judgment, when your deeds are being taken away from you because you harm people, right? For some people, their good deeds will keep on being transferred to a person that they harm, they backbite it, and so on and so forth. The last deed to be held would be fasting. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would leave that, and if your fasting was special enough, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would increase your fasting, the reward of your fasting, to where it covers for the deficiency in the other good deeds. You guys understand what's happening here? Like, you're losing all of these other good deeds out, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He saw your special fasting in Ramadan, Allah takes those deeds of fasting, and Allah just keeps on making it bigger and bigger and bigger, so that it covers for your deficiencies, for whatever reason you have deficiencies in your other good deeds. So that's also something that comes from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, uh, there's a hadith as well from Abu Hurairah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, لِلصَّائِمِ فَرْحَتَان That there are two joys for the fasting person. فَرْحَةٌ حِينَ يُفْطِرْ That there is a joy when he breaks his fast. وَفَرْحَةٌ حِينَ يَلْقَى, حين يلقى رَبَّهُ And there is another joy when he meets Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. صحيح ضعيف. This is an authentic one. So, so far we've covered the virtues of Ramadan as a, when it comes to protecting you from hellfire, when it comes to entering you into Jannah, and when it comes to the reward in the Day of Judgment. Alright, what about the reward in this world? Uh, Abu Huraira says that the Prophet ﷺ says, Sumu tasihu, fast and you will be healthy. Sahih or da'if? It's a da'if hadith. This is a weak hadith. Commonly quoted, fast and you will be healthy. However, the meaning, this is one of those hadith, you know, that they say the sanad is weak, the chain is weak, but the ma'na, the matan, the, the text of it is, 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 is correct. And it, it just with the generality of the other hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about not overeating, about training the stomach and things of that sort, that it's good for you, and that it helps you and things of that sort. And obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who ordered, you know, through this religion, la darara wa la dirar, that there's no harm or reciprocating of harm, Allah would not give you something except that it's good for you. And everything that Allah has legislated upon us is good for us for the hereafter and for this world as well. Like doesn't Salah have health benefits? Does prayer have health benefits? Yeah, definitely. SubhanAllah, you see people over a hundred years old that have been praying their whole life and they can still do sajda. It's, it's remarkable, right? Because they've, they've gotten their bodies used to moving in a certain way and doing sajda and work, it's, it's literally an exercise for them, subhanAllah. But is there a hadith that says, Sallu tasihu, you know, pray and you will be healthy? No. So likewise, there is no hadith that says, um, well actually the hadith is weak, it's in a tabarani, it's not an authentic hadith, but it says, you know, sumu tasihu, it's not appropriate to say the Prophet ﷺ says, sumu tasihu, as we see in many different, uh, you know, narrations and things of that sort, or many different posts, alright? Now what about the, you know, multiplying your deeds? I'll go through some hadith. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ says, Ramadan is in Medina is better than a thousand Ramadans in other than it from the, from the lands. And Jum'ah in Medina is better than a thousand Jum'ahs in other than it from the lands. Sahih or Da'if? This is a fabricated hadith, Maldur. Um, another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, to perform Umrah during Ramadan is equal in reward to performing Hajj with me. Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. You guys sure? I'm saying that to do Umrah on Ramadan is like doing Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. That's a Sahih Hadith. Beautiful Hadith. Kal Hajju Ma'i. And actually the context of this Hadith is beautiful. Basically, there's a woman that, that, that was telling her husband the one year the Prophet ﷺ did Hajj. Alright, he only did one Hajj in his life, right? And she was telling her husband, we've got to go do Hajj with the Prophet The husband was like, I don't have the money, I can't go out and do Hajj. He's from Medina, so he's like, we can't do Hajj with the Prophet 
So she said, then prepare a camel for me and support me and I'll go out with the other group of women. I want to do Hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu He said, I don't even have the money to do that. So she argued with her husband and she tried to do Hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu and it didn't work out and it passed. And she came to the Prophet Sallallahu after the Prophet Sallallahu had done Hajj and she cried and she gave the Prophet Sallallahu her udhr. She gave the Prophet Sallallahu her, you know, her excuse. Now, the Prophet ﷺ could have told her, don't worry, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Right? Actions are but by intentions. You'll still get the reward of Hajj. Instead, the Prophet ﷺ says, you know what? Next time Ramadan comes up, go do Umrah. And it's as if you've done Hajj with me. Now there's, so the beauty of that obviously is that the Prophet ﷺ, he expanded the mercy, right? The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually expands, right? It could have just been, don't worry, you get the reward. Alright? But instead, Anyone who does Umrah in Ramadan gets the reward. Is it only in the last 10 nights? No. Who does Umrah in any time period in Ramadan? I see some of you just pulled your phones out. You're trying to book a ticket now. <laughs> All right. Anyone who does Umrah any time in Ramadan, it's as if they've done Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. Now there's another beautiful historical explanation of this hadith too, by the way. The Prophet ﷺ could have told her, well just get yourself ready to do Hajj with me next time. But the Prophet ﷺ knew that he was going to pass away. All right, so he knew he wasn't going to live to see Hajj again. He could have told her, don't worry, we'll make it happen for next year. But instead, he opened it up. And in fact, he wouldn't live to see the next Ramadan. So the Prophet ﷺ made it a mercy for the Ummah that whoever can go out and do Hajj, can do Umrah in Ramadan, it's as if they've done Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. We ask Allah SWT to write that all down for us. Allahumma ameen. All right, this hadith now, uh, it's narrated by Az-Zuhri, that the Prophet Sallallahu says, Tasbihatun fi Ramadan afdalu min alfi tasbihatun fi ghayrihi. To say one subhanallah, one tasbiha in Ramadan, is greater than a thousand tasbihas in other than Ramadan. Sahih or da'if? This is commonly quoted as a hadith. It's actually narrated in Al-Bukhari, but it's a statement of Imam Az-Zuhri. Alright, so Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala sometimes in his chapters, those of you that have been studying Al-Bukhari with me know that he puts the statements of some of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een to basically prove the point of the top of that chapter or of the title of that chapter, then he puts the Ahadith. So this is a statement of an Imam Al-Zuhri rahimahullah ta'ala that's in Sahih Al-Bukhari. That to say SubhanAllah in Ramadan is greater than saying SubhanAllah a thousand times outside of Ramadan. There's another hadith that to fast one day in Ramadan is better than fasting a thousand other days. To proclaim, the, the, to, to do one tasbih in Ramadan is better than doing tasbih a thousand times outside of Ramadan. And one rak'ah of prayer in Ramadan is better than a thousand rak'ahs of, uh, of prayer outside of Ramadan. What do you guys think? This is not a hadith as well, but it's also narrated from Ibrahim and Nakha'i, the teacher of Imam al-Bukhari. I just want you to see, sometimes there are things that get circulated as a hadith, but they're not a hadith, but still, we can act upon them. They take the generality that things in Ramadan are just super multiplied. All your deeds in Ramadan are super multiplied. So we would hope that everything that we do, inshallah ta'ala, is times a thousand. Now where do you guys think they keep getting the number a thousand from? What hadith? Why the number a thousand? Laylatul Qadri Khairun min alfi shahr. Okay? So that's why they keep mentioning that, that Laylatul Qadr is better than a thousand months of worship. So they keep on mentioning this number of a thousand. You frequently find it in the books of Tazkiyah of Spirituality when they quote the Salaf, the pious predecessors, that they mention a reward being multiplied by a thousand. Alright? Now, Ramadan as the month of Qur'an. Shahrul Qur'an. Alright? The Prophet Wasallam says, that uh, the suhuf of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the scriptures of Abraham, were revealed on the first night of Ramadan. The Torah was revealed on the sixth night of, uh, on the sixth, actually, yeah, on the sixth of Ramadan. He doesn't say sixth night. The Injil, the Gospels were revealed on the thirteenth of Ramadan. The Zabur of, of uh, Dawood alayhi salam, the Psalms were revealed on the eighteenth of Ramadan, and the Quran was revealed on the twenty-fourth of Ramadan. Sahih or Daif? Everyone has to say something. Sahih or Daif? This hadith is of the strongest authenticity. Sahih hadith. Muslim Imam Ahmad, and it's a beautiful hadith. 
Can you imagine? Not only was Qur'an revealed in Ramadan, all of the scriptures were revealed in the month of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correlated the revelation, the wahi. And this obviously is referring to the entire scripture, like were the entire suhuf revealed in Ramadan? Or the entire gospels or the entire... No. This means that, the, that Allah initiated that communication with all of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at some point in Ramadan. Okay? Now, if it was revealed on the 24th of Ramadan, that would make Laylatul Qadr, in this case, the 25th night of Ramadan. 24th day, 25th night of Ramadan. So this also shows you that you have to seek it in all of the last 10 nights, the odd nights, because it could really be any of them. All right. So this is a narration that shows us that Ramadan is the month not only of the Qur'an, it's the month of divine revelation. It is the month that Allah has chosen to always initiate His contact with His messengers. And Imam Ibn Al-Qayyib rahimahullah ta'ala, he says in Miftah Dar al-Sa'adah, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the month of Ramadan the, the month in which He initiated wahi, revelation for all of His messengers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the month of Ramadan the month in which he allows all of the other servants to turn back to him. Like he initiates that, that, that new relationship, that new found relationship with all of his servants in Ramadan. So there's a, a blessing of us knowing that as well. We also know that Jibreel alayhi salam used to come to the Prophet sallallahu in the month of Ramadan and he would review the Qur'an with the Prophet sallallahu every single Ramadan. That's sahih as well. And in the last year, he did what with the Prophet sallallahu he reviewed it twice with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, There's another hadith from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As anhu that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that fasting and the Qur'an will intercede on behalf of Allah's servant on the Day of Judgment. يَقُولُ الصِّيَامِ Fasting will see. أَيْ Rabb, O my Lord, مَنَعْتُهُ الطَّعَامِ والشهوات. I forbade him from food and desires during the day. فَشَفِّعْنِي So accept my intercession for him. وَيَقُولُ الْقُرْآنِ The Qur'an will say, أَيْ رَبْ O my Lord, مَنَعْتُهُ النَّوْمُ بِاللَّيْلِ I, I forbade him from sleeping at night. فَشَفِّعْنِي So accept my intercession for him. So both of their intercessions will be accepted. صحيح or ضعيف? This is an authentic hadith. So subhanAllah, on the Day of Judgment, the fasting that you do will actually come as well as the Qur'an, which you're more likely to read in Ramadan more than any other time, they will both come and argue on your behalf. So they will both come and intercede on your behalf on the Day of Judgment. All right. Now, what about some of the manners at iftar? Some of the virtues of the iftar and the things that the Prophet ﷺ used to do at the iftar. All right. So this hadith uh, says that the Prophet ﷺ used to say when he broke his fast, Allahumma laka sumt wa ala rizqik aftart ذَهَبَ الظَّمَى وَابْتَلَّتِ الْعُرُوقِ وَثَبَتَ الْأَجْرُ إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهِ صحيح or ضعيف? This is a weak hadith. The first part of it is weak. اللَّهُمَ لَكَ سُمْتْ وَعَلَى رِزْقِكَ أَفْطَرْتْ So that portion of the dua that you learn to say at iftar is actually not authentic. The part that is authentic, and this is narrated from uh, Marwan ibn Salim al-Muqaffa' who says that I saw Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu holding his beard and he was cutting what exceeded a fist length, and then uh, he was he broke his fast soon after that, and uh, he said, "ذهب الظما وابتلت العروق وثبت الأجر إن شاء الله." "ذهب الظما" means the thirst has gone. "وابتلت العروق" the arteries have bec- the, the the veins have become moist. "وثبت الأجر إن شاء الله," and the reward is confirmed by the Allah Taala by by the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So he said, "I heard the Prophet Sallallahu when he used to break his fast, he used to say this." All right. So that's the du'a that we would make. Um, all right, now how did the Prophet Sallallahu used to break his fast? I'm not trying to get into too many fiqhi issues, but just to, just to go through some of the common misconceptions, probably in the next five to seven minutes, inshallah, then we'll end it. Um, one hadith, that the Prophet Sallallahu this is from Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the Prophet Sallallahu used to love to break his fast with three dates or something which had not been touched by the fire. What does something which had not been touched by the fire mean? Like dry foods, not cooked. Water, dates, all right? So not halim, not samosas, not <laughs> pakoras, not whatever it is that you guys do, right? What did the Prophet ﷺ used to like to break his fast with? Water and dates, right? Is this hadith sahih or daif? This one is daif. Sorry guys, right, you guys are like, oh God. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Still, the Prophet ﷺ used to like to break his fast with dates and water and dry foods. There's no doubt about it. 
However, there is nothing that establishes that the Prophet ﷺ in Ramadan in particular would break his fast with three dates. Okay? In fact, there's a hadith in Bukhari, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم يُفْطِرُ عَلَى تَمَرٍ أَوْ تَمَرَانٍ The Prophet ﷺ would break his fast with one or two dates, or a few sips of water. Alright? Where do we get the concept of the Prophet ﷺ using an odd number of dates? It's hadith in Bukhari from Anas ta'ala anhu that the Prophet ﷺ, when he used to proceed to Eid al-Fitr, before he would proceed to the Eid al-Fitr, before he'd pr proceed to the Eid prayer, Rasulullah would eat some dates. Um, وتراً, and he used to eat an odd number of dates. So the, the narration of eating an odd number of dates, it comes from Eid al-Fitr. Alright, that on the day of Eid al-Fitr. However, Generally speaking, the Prophet ﷺ can a yultir. He used to do. He used to eat odd and, and things of that sort. So you could do that, but just the sunnah or the perceived sunnah of like eating three dates in particular is not something that comes from the Messenger ﷺ. All right, the next hadith. لا يزال الناس. I'll just give you guys five more minutes, inshallah ta'ala. لا يزال الناس بخير ما عجل الفطر. Sahir رضي الله عنه says that the Prophet ﷺ said the people will continue to remain on the right path. So long as they hasten to break their fast, meaning they hurry up and break their fast. Sahih or Daif? This hadith is in Bukhari, it's Sahih. Now you might be thinking to yourself, like, why the emphasis on, like, لا يزال الناس بخير? Like, this is when people will be good. Like, when people stop breaking their fast right away, then they're going to, then everything's going to fall apart. Like, why would the Prophet son emphasize this so strongly? Right? Is it really a big deal? Like, if I break my fast right away, or if I wait a few minutes? SubhanAllah, there, there, you know, we, we find some different um, ahadith which, which basically explain that. They're also authentic ahadith. There's a hadith in Abu, Abu Dawood where the Prophet وسلم, he said, Ajr uh, al-Fitr, to hurry up and break your fast. He says, Al Yahud wal Nasara yu'akhirun al iftara ila ashtibak al nujum. That the Jews and the Christians, their habit is to delay their breaking of the fast until they see the stars. Meaning it wasn't by the sunset, it was by seeing the stars. And Imam al-Baghawi rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that what the Prophet ﷺ was referring to was certain sects that would break out of the orthodox of Islam and they would start to innovate. And one of their innovations would be delaying the iftar until the appearance of the stars. And subhanAllah, that actually became truth. The, the, the major break off sects in Islam, they delay their iftar until they see the stars as opposed to the sunset. Which is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said not to do. So there's more to the hadith than what meets the eye, basically. It's not like, you know, if, if, if uh, you know, I actually remember in Sunday school one time, like I didn't break my fast right away and I just wanted to use the bathroom. Like my Sunday school teacher was like, you know, she's like quoting this hadith at me and she's like, you know, everything's gonna fall apart if you don't hurry up and break your fast. Like I need to use the bathroom first, all right? Then we'll, that'll be a different day of Yom Al Qiyamah for me, like if I, if I don't use the bathroom right now, all right? But, um, so yeah, there's more to what meets the eye and, and what the Prophet ﷺ was telling us is that as a people, we should abide by that sunnah of the Messenger ﷺ. As soon as the iftar time comes in, we should break our fast. When it comes to suhoor, the Prophet ﷺ says, تَسَحَّرُوا فَإِنَّ فِي السُحُورِ بَرَكَةً That eat your suhoor, you know, eat a, a, a little meal before the Fajr prayer, and verily there is a blessing in eating suhoor at that time, and eating at that time. Sahih or da'if? This is Sahih in Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ, he also said in a hadith from Abu Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the suhoor is a blessed meal, so do not neglect it even if you just swallow a mouthful of water, even if you take a few sips of water. And he says that, uh, فَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى الْمُتَسَاحِرِينَ that, that verily the angels, they send their prayers upon those who eat suhoor. Sahih or da'if? Sahih. It's authentic. So it's not only blessed, but the angels actually prey upon those who eat their suhoor. Uh, Amr ibn Aas says, the Prophet ﷺ says, مَا بَيْنَ صِيَامِنَا وَصِيَامِ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ أَكْلَةُ السَّحَرِ That the distinction between our fast and the people of the scripture, the people of the book, is the early morning meal. Sahih or Laif? It's also an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim. Okay? Uh, you guys have five more minutes and you guys want to quit now? Okay. No, actually, inshallah, I'm gonna quit because I, I think we'll we'll do inshallah ta'ala um, next week. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about the ahadith on the virtues of Laylatul Qadr and seeking out Laylatul Qadr and and making the most of Qiyamul Layl in Ramadan. Inshallah ta'ala. 
So with that, inshallah, we'll conclude tonight, inshallah ta'ala. So jazakumullah khayran. Um, you guys are welcome to ask questions now. I'll take questions for a few minutes instead. You guys aren't completely like confused now, are you? Like everything we've been taught is wrong? I didn't give you guys too many fabricated hadiths, right? All right, question back there. <coughs> Can you raise your voice? I can't. Well, so, so the gates of so the hadith saying that the gates of paradise are open in Ramadan and the gates of hellfire are closed. What exactly does that mean? Uh, as we said, the, the avenues towards paradise are open, are more open, and the avenues towards hellfire are closed. And also in the literal meaning of it, um, you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is not fully entering people into paradise or hellfire now anyway. So what it means is that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is writing down people's names. Like he's opening paradise for the people. He's writing down their names as amongst the people of paradise. And he's, you know, uh, preventing them from having their names written in the hellfire at that time. But obviously, all of these ahadith are to be taken at their general meaning. And there are always exceptions to these ahadith. Always. Wallah, and that's the most we can make out of it from the hadith. Any sisters? Yeah. As soon as the Adhan starts, as soon as sunset starts, even if the Imam hasn't even started making Adhan yet, if sunset has come in, you can break your fast at that time. And then my second question is, so I was, I've always said that, um, you know, before you break your fast, Allahumma inna like, so does that mean that we're not supposed to say that, or we can say that? Uh, so generally speaking, dua before iftar is a good thing, all right? Um, the, the, but the dua from the Prophet ﷺ is ذَهَبَ الظَّمَعَ وَابْتَلَّتِ الْعُرُوكِ وَثَبَتِ الْأَجْرُ InshaAllah So you should say that part and you say it after you break your fast. So the Prophet ﷺ would say Bismillah He would take a bite or he would take a sip and then he would make that dua. Alright? Yeah. Any other authentic dua that the Prophet ﷺ used to make when he broke his fast? Not, not necessarily, no. So just dua before the, the like those last moments of the day of fasting are precious moments. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that uh, the, the fasting person's dua is accepted until he breaks his fast. No, so there's no such concept. And Sheikh Yasser, I think, will, qual will, will uh, expand upon this question on Friday, inshallah. But the concept of imsak, which is to hold yourself before the Fajr Adhan, has no place in Islam. Uh, in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, they would eat and drink literally until the time of Fajr came in. Yeah. So, the, so eating up until the Adhan of Fajr is something that's established. Is there a dua for suhoor? Um, I don't know if there's anything authentic about the dua of suhoor. You start your fast. Inshallah, if sisters can wait. But you start your fast until. Uh, you start your fast with the intention to fast. Yes. No, when, when Fajr time enters, that's when you stop. Yeah, because then if you get a guy making a really long adhan, then <laughs> it wouldn't be really fair, right? No, uh, when, once the time of Fajr comes in, that's it. Yeah. Is the reward actually equal to the actual number of given, or is it just an emphasis? 
Okay, so that's a good question. Um, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Messenger Islam, mentions a number, is it for emphasis or is it literal? Uh, in the Arabic language, the word sab'een, 70, usually means kathra. It usually means an abundance. Like, you know when we say it's like a million? So sab'een was that word. So for example, when the Prophet <coughs> mentions that, that the ummah would split up into you know, uh, 73 sects, most of the ulama said the Prophet ﷺ was not literally saying 73 sects. He, mentioned, he was talking about abundance. Like, it would be numerous sects. All right? So some of those ahadith certainly, you know, are for emphasis, to, to just represent abundance, kathra. Uh, some of them are literal. What we take from it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always more merciful than what we expect of Him. So we hope inshallah ta'ala will be more than that. So it will never be less than what was mentioned. See, when Allah or the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emphasize something, then it's always going to be on the higher end, in terms of mercy and expanse. Yeah, I'll take two more questions, inshallah. Yeah. I, I can't hear you because the kids, I'm sorry. Imam Shafir. No, because even the Sahaba, so the, the, the question is, when we hear a narration, like Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah ta'ala used to recite the Qur'an 60 times in Ramadan. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, this is narrated in, in Shu'b al-Iman by al-Bayhaqi, that Uthman ibn Affan, in fact, one of the reasons why he was called Dhul Nurain, the possessor of two lights, aside from being married to two daughters of the Prophet sallallahu was that Uthman radiallahu anhu had the habit of finishing the Qur'an twice a day. Now, how do we understand this? There are two things to understand here. Number one, time, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, at the time of these people was different than our time. This is one of those phenomenons. The Prophet ﷺ said that, لا تقوم السعد, that the hour will not be established until time shrinks. So a year will be like a month, a month will be like a week, a week will be like a day, a day will be like an hour, and an hour will be like burning grass. So our time is not like their time. SubhanAllah, the things they were able to accomplish, and just from a productivity perspective, like you see the amount of things, when you just study like the incidents in one day, just forget about personal ibadat, like how are they able, how was so much able to take place in one day? SubhanAllah, you realize that the time that they had was different from our time. Now as far as contradicting, when the Prophet ﷺ said that a person should not read the Qur'an more than once within three days, okay? Uh, is that a contradiction? The Prophet ﷺ used to give certain advices to certain people knowing their level. And there were exceptions to every rule. So for example, the Prophet ﷺ did not allow his companions to give all of their money in charity, but he allowed Abu Bakr to do it. The Prophet ﷺ did not allow people to do Sawm Wisad, which is to connect days of fasting, to not break your fast, to just fast two days or three days at a time. Fast, just carry over to the next day. He prohibited his companions, but he allowed some people to do it. So Abdullah ibn Zubayr anhu did it for multiple days, and the Prophet ﷺ was silent about it. Um, the Prophet ﷺ generally said a person should not fast more than once every two days. Like the Psalm of the Siyam of Dawood, the fasting of David, which is to fast one day and break your fast the next day. So to fast alternate days. But Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu was given permission to fast every day of the year outside of the two Eids. So, this, so it's the same with Qur'an, with prayer, with fasting, with charity. There were exceptions to all of these things. The Prophet ﷺ didn't want to set a standard that was impossible for people. So Shafi'i never came out and told people, you know, you need to recite the Qur'an 60 times a day. So when you hear these narrations, or Uthman anhu, when you hear these narrations, these are things that were specific to those people. And what we take from that is when the Prophet ﷺ prohibited, when he put limitations, it was, it was not tahrim, it wasn't forbidding or prohibition, it was, to, it was out of caution that a person doesn't burn out or set unreasonable expectations for themselves. Wallahu Yeah. Is it better for us not mention that number? Yeah. No, it's not. It's better for us to read those numbers and those narrations with a sense of like, not with a sense of despair. Like for example, if I see a Shafi'i read the Qur'an 60 times in Ramadan, and I don't go, astaghfirullah, I'm not even going to try to read Qur'an because I'll never reach that. I take that and I say, well, let me try to read 60 ayahs a day. You know, I use that as motivation in my own context. I try to internalize that in my capacity, within my potential. 
and with, with, with what I can do. So just generally speaking, when you, it's like in the fundraisers, right? When the fundraiser stands up and says, and Abu Bakr gave everything and said, what did you leave for your family? And he said, Allah and His Messenger Wasallam, And like, all of you clear your bank accounts now. Right? Which you shouldn't do except for the Valley Ranch Expansion Project. All right. <laughs> shouldn't do it for anything else in Ramadan. Um, <laughs> but, no, but, but, but seriously, it's, it's, you know, these are things that we internalize and we say, okay, in my capacity, you know, I see that narration of Abu Bakr and I say, you know, I need to give more salaqah. Not that I'm going to go give everything in salaqah. Because the Prophet ﷺ stopped people from doing that. Like Ka'b ibn Malik said, I'm giving everything away. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, you're not. I'm sick. عليك بعض المال. Abu Talha said, I'm giving it all away. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, ara an taj'alaha fil aqrabin. Give it to your family instead. So certain people, the Prophet ﷺ recognized they could do more. So we mention them as inspiration for ourselves. That's all. Not to... Not to belittle ourselves or, or, or to just neglect the entire narration. I'll go one brother, one sister quickly. Yes? Uh, fasting six days after Ramadan. Fasting six shawal is sunnah, yeah. Six days after Ramadan. Yes? Um, what's the ruling on fasting that you've missed before the following Ramadan due to pregnancy and or breastfeeding? Can you just pay a certain amount of money? Are you coming Friday? Okay, if you are, I'd rather you leave it for Sheikh Yasser because it's, I'm, he's going to address the fiqhi question, inshallah. Time. No, you can break the fast with anything that's halal to, to, to break your fast with. But it's just sunnah to, to try to do it with, with dates and, and water. And that breaking of the fast, can that be also your thought? For example, like, yeah. let's say third world countries, they can't, I mean, they break their fast. Absolutely. That's their thought. Yeah, absolutely. That is the thought. Anyway, for all of us, it is the thought. Okay. Zakhmalah khairin yo. Barakallahu fikum. Subhanakallahu alhamdulillah. Ashhadu alaihi wasallam. Tastakhiru kuwaitu bilik.